My chief attraction to Jesus at that age was that even though he started out a plain old little boy like me, he grew up to become someone so mysterious and great that my siblings and I were now being taught to pray to him. Talk about a success. I tried to imagine my siblings or me growing up to become someone people prayed to. It was unthinkable. A second thing that attracted me to Jesus at seven, his father was allegedly God. And God had made the world and trees and rivers and stars and mountains and clouds and sunlight and raspberries and wildflowers and wilderness. And even though nobody could prove any of this like scientifically, I loved the world God had allegedly made so much that it didn't seem like a good that it seemed like a good idea to love God too. Only I didn't. Loving creation made sense to me the same way that loving, say, peanut M and M's makes sense. You toss a handful in your mouth, crunch down, your taste buds fire off, and without even trying, yum, love, gratitude, piece of cake. Loving the invisible God who'd created creation, on the other hand, felt more like trying to love the unknown and invisible people who worked at the peanut M&M's factory. This, I felt, was where Jesus came in. Because he'd been a regular little boy, then a less regular but still lovable man, there was somebody there to know. Knowing Jesus was like knowing the son of somebody who worked at the peanut M&M's factory. Without him, I pretty much drew a blank on who to thank for the many things for which I was grateful. Knowing him put me in more of a, hey guy, your dad makes great stuff position. That's how I saw it at seven anyway. When I sat down to pen my story, there were a few storytelling tools I lacked. On the writing side, for instance, I wasn't yet sure what a quotation mark, paragraph, or comma was. And I'd never even heard of stuff like scene, plot, dialogue, symbolism, metaphor. The one thing I knew about run-on sentences was they sounded great to me. But I'd been literate for several months. I played baseball. I rode a bike. I figured I could drive a dang pencil across a page without crashing. On the faith side of the project, there were also doctrinal issues I hadn't yet gotten on top of and never would, as it's turned out. But I felt I knew the basics. I knew, for instance, that Jesus was born the year they started counting on December 25th, zero. I knew he was the son of a good Christian couple named Joseph and Mary, though the last name, hmm, Joseph and Mary Christ was my best guess. <laughs> I knew Joseph was a carpenter and that he taught his trade to Jesus, but that Jesus, like me, preferred fishing to carpentry, understandably, given the cross. I knew that Joseph's claim to fame was his marriage to Mary, who was the only virgin in the whole wide world, hence a miracle. I knew Mary had lots of kids anyway, which was another miracle. The main thing was I knew her eldest son, Jesus, was the biggest miracle of all because of how he was God's son as well as Joseph's, in sort of the same way I figured that puppies or kittens can have more than one sire per litter. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> it's just water. This multiple dad concept was what triggered my fiction, actually. It fired my imagination, first of all, because my two older brothers were adopted, and I wasn't. This really bugged me as a kid. When my parents would order my siblings and me to weed the garden or muck out the chicken house or rake the yard, my big brother John would set to work beside me, grumbling, my real parents would never make me do this. My real parents are trapeze artists in the circus. You lucky bum, I'd think, because my real parents were the two utterly non-trapezian grumps who just put us to work. I figured that when Joseph, back in Bible times, doled out grunt chores to the Christ boys, Jesus could turn to his siblings just like John turned to me and grouse, my real dad would never make me do this. My real dad built the whole universe. My other fascination with the multiple dads had to do with birthday presents. What concerned me was that Jesus was the best boy ever, apparently, and good boys deserve birthday presents from all their fathers. But Jesus' heavy-duty dad was either invisible or living up in heaven, so how to get presents from an invisible or heavenly father down to a deserving but earthbound son? Solving this difficulty was my literary mission. My sense of the situation was that even though Jesus was the son of God, he was going to need some plain old human faith in order to locate a gift from his invisible father. 
if he slumped around the house on his birthday like some modern child of divorce grumbling, God's my real dad. Yeah, but big whip. Because when is invisible, all-powerful dad going to visibly remember my birthday? I figured he was screwed from the get-go. But if first thing birthday morn he jumped up off the couch and went out alone into the part of the world his father had actually made and humans hadn't yet wrecked, namely wilderness, and if he walked around out there with an alert eye and hopeful heart, maybe good things could happen. Since I didn't know what paragraphs were, my first short story turned out to be one paragraph long. Its title was supposed to be Deborah after a pretty girl I'd recently met in a picture book. But I somehow misremembered her ah as a ha, spelled my title and pronounced it Deborha. <laughs> my first and last Christic fiction started like this. It was the day before Christmas. Jesus was going to be seven years old. He had fed all the animals but the sheep. When he got to the fold, one of the sheep were gone. Its name was Deborha. <laughs> Jesus ran to his house and ate his breakfast. That last sentence, I must interrupt to say, is my favorite bit of fiction making in the story. Check it out, young writers. Jesus ran to his house and ate his breakfast. This is the kind of spontaneous detail that other writers about Christ haven't dared to imagine. <laughs> not Kazantzakis, not Jose Saramago, not Robert Graves, and certainly not Norman Mailer. I really captured something fresh there. I'm thinking out to pen an entire novel someday titled, Jesus ran to his house and ate his breakfast. But on with the story. Jesus ran to his house and ate his breakfast. Then he went up in the mountains and looked for his lost sheep, calling, Debor ha! Debor ha! He looked and looked, and at last he saw some wool on a bush. He walked and walked, and a little later said a prayer, Dear God, please help me to find Debor ha! Amen. Nice run on there. Then Jesus thought he knew where to look. It was over in a pasture, in another place, where a spring of water was. When he got there, he saw... Deborha! Oh, Deborha, I've been so worried about you, but just then he saw something moving. Deborha, you have a baby lamb. Last year, God gave me a sparrow with a broken wing, and this year, he gave me a lamb, said Jesus. Sorry to interrupt again, but see how that trust in wilderness thing works out? Free lambs, free sparrows, direct mailed from the Father. That's how wilderness works for me, anyway. Okay, up to here, I had a pretty good thing going. Even pronounced wrong, Deborha was starting to give me an I might like to do this when I grow up kind of feeling. Then came that dark night of the literary soul, the problem in the story you are just too dumb to solve. My plan was to send Jesus home with his baby lamb, let him hang out with his miraculous mom, and the two of them could chat a bit about his birthday. But as I aimed my imagination in this direction, I couldn't for the life of me imagine what Jesus and Mary would sit around and chat about. I figured the topics would have to be very important, them being the mother and son of God. But, oh my hell, how to get Mary the miraculous virgin and Jesus the Christ himself to sound natural and believable as they chatted about various intergalactic wonderments. I was so daunted by this difficulty, I made poor Jesus sit there like a stick of furniture, not saying a word, which left me Mary to work with. But what does the virgin's chit-chat with her son sound like? I had no idea. In my decades of reading and writing since, I've learned that when panic-stricken authors have no idea, they divide into two schools. One school summons a great false confidence to cover their doubt and writes as if they're chiseling the words in marble. Where I have this school, I'd have written, Lo, tis I, the Virgin Mary, chatting with my son, Lord Jesus the Christ, upon the evening of only the seventh Christmas in all of world history. <laughs> this is how I talketh, by the by, and if it soundeth passing, passing strange or unreal to your ignorant and unworthy ears, you better believeth it anyhow, Buster, because I am one important lady. The other school of panic-struck writers try to avoid thinking altogether. Instead, they drink four or five cups of coffee or a pint of whiskey, so they stare at the blank page, then explode in a burst of word jazz they hope readers will mistake for early Kerouac. That was my approach. My Jesus and Mary birthday scene went 